Hi everyone, today I want to talk about Pythagoras' theorem, which is perhaps the most famous theorem in mathematics. So, you know it, the square on the hypotenuse of a right angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Blum, bum, bum. So everyone knows it, but what you might not know is it's not just for squares. So this is what I want to do. I want to experiment with some other shapes. We'll look at circles and triangles and pentagons, and then we're going to take what we learn and we're going to use it to prove Pythagoras' theorem itself itself using an idea from a young Albert Einstein. All true, but let's start by looking at the original Pythagoras' theorem. So the original theorem says take a right angled triangle and then add a square to each side of the triangle. So we're going to have a big square and then two smaller squares. Then the Pythagorean theorem says that the area of the big square is equal to the total area of the two smaller squares. Or if we label the sides A, B and C, then the big square will have an area of C squared and the smaller squares will have areas of A squared and B squared. And then we get A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But what about instead of squares, I use semicircles. What is the area of the big semicircle here? Well, the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. We're going to use half of that and the radius would be C over 2. So we're going to get a half pi c over 2 squared, which is pi over 8 c squared. And in the same way, the other semicircles will have areas of pi over 8 a squared and pi over 8 b squared. Now, because Pythagoras' theorem is true, we know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, which automatically means that pi over 8 a squared plus pi over 8 b squared equals pi over 8 c squared. So the semicircle on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the semicircles on the other two sides. We have a Pythagorean theorem for semicircles as well. But what about triangles? So if we use equilateral triangles here, the area of the big triangle is going to be half the base times the height. Well now, a triangle of side length 1 would have a height of root 3 over 2. So the area would be root 3 over 4. But we've got a triangle here of side length c. So we're going to scale that up and you will see the base is multiplied by c and so is the height. So now it's root 3 over 2 multiplied by c. And so the total area is root 3 over 4 c squared. In the same way, the other triangles have areas root 3 over 4 a squared and root 3 over 4 b squared. Now, because Pythagoras' theorem is true, we automatically have root 3 over 4 a squared plus root 3 over 4 b squared equal to root 3 over 4 c squared. So the area of the big triangle is the sum of the two smaller triangles. So let's keep going. What about pentagons? Well, by now you might be able to predict what's going to happen. Let's say we took a pentagon of side length 1. Well, there is a formula to work out the area of a pentagon. It's quite complicated and actually it doesn't even matter. Let's say for our purpose that the area is about 1.72. But if we scale that up by c, then the width and the height is multiplied by c, which means the area is multiplied by c squared. So the area of the big pentagon here is going to be 1.72 c squared. And in the same way, the other pentagons are going to have areas of 1.72 a squared and 1.72 b squared. And because Pythagorean theorem is true, we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we automatically get 1.72 a squared plus 1.72 b squared equals 1.72 c squared. We do have a Pythagorean theorem for pentagons as well. And some of you may have noticed by now that this idea will work for any shape, even something like this wobble, where the wobbles here are just scale versions of themselves. Then the wobble on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the wobbles on the other two sides. And that's because if we imagine a wobble of side length 1, it would have some area, let's call it A. And if we scale that up by a factor of C, the area is scaled by a factor of C squared. So because Pythagoras' theorem is true, then the areas will be equal for any shape. But now here comes the clever part. We can actually prove Pythagoras' theorem by running that argument in the opposite direction. 
And that's exactly what a young Albert Einstein did when, as a child, he came up with his own proof for Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, the way Einstein told the story, he was 11 years old, he was learning classic Greek maths, like the Pythagorean theorem, and he kind of found it annoying, it's a bit too wordy, kind of unnecessarily complicated, so he came up with his own proof for the Pythagorean theorem, which basically comes down to drawing one line. This is a one-line proof. So here is the right-angled triangle, and here is the line. So what has he done here? Well, he's created three triangles. We've got the big triangle and two smaller triangles. Uh, you might be able to see that better if we kind of flip them out. So we have the big triangle, which is the same as the original, and the two smaller triangles. In fact, they're just scaled up versions of themselves. We know they're the same because they actually have all the same angles. Therefore, they are the same triangle, but scaled up. Let's call the area of these triangles a, B, and C, then simply by definition, the two smaller triangles add up to the bigger triangle. So we have A plus B equals C. But now we can think of each triangle as just being like some other triangle, let's say of area X, but scaled up by factors of A squared, B squared, and C squared. And then a simple cancellation will prove that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And that is a proof of the Pythagorean theorem, and it's such a neat idea. So instead of showing that when Pythagoras' theorem is true, then the areas must be equal, then in this case, if the areas are equal, then Pythagoras' theorem must be true. And if you have been, thanks for watching.